So 12 million people are arrested in this country every year. Millions of those then go into the criminal justice system. And if you've seen Don Porter's film, you know that the system of justice is not equal. It's not uncommon for public defenders to be handling hundreds of cases at a time with great pressure to plead out their cases and to move them along as fast as they can. And the question that faces us then is, what does this mean for a system of justice? This is exactly the question that animated lawyer turned filmmaker Don Porter to develop a, a, a look at this problem through her film, Gideon's Army. She follows three young public defenders in the Deep South during their daily mission to counsel hundreds of defendants through the strained and breaking criminal justice system. Ms. Porter also works in narrative features as an executive producer on Sirius Moonlight, written by Adrian Shelley and starring Meg Ryan and Timothy Hutton. Sirius Moonlight debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival and was released theatrically by Magnolia Pictures and domestically as on Lifetime Movie Network. She's also an executive producer on The Green, an independent feature on Showtime Networks. Before becoming a filmmaker, she was uh, director of News Standards and Practices at ABC News, uh, vice president of Standards and Practices at A&E Network. She also has worked as a practicing attorney at Baker and Hochstetler and ABC Television Network. Uh, she's a graduate of Swarthmore College and the Georgetown University Law Center. And she brings tonight just a wealth of experience and passion on a subject that we're very privileged to be able to hear tonight. So please join me in giving a warm Wheaton welcome to Don Porter. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so thrilled to see all of you, um, mostly because I was snowed out before. And so I'm glad I'm not snowed out again. And I'm glad you all braved the elements. Um, I'm from New York City, so I'm no stranger to the cold. But it's awfully cold here. Um, so uh, I'm quite proud of myself that I'm here uh, and I've joined you tonight. Um, I want to thank you for the lovely prayer opening. Um, I, I find that quite meaningful because as I embarked on this journey to create this film, it was the first film I'd ever made. Um, and one of the objectives I had was uh, kind of, as you said in your prayer, to invite people to come to the topic wherever they are. Um, so it was not my intention to tell anyone what to think. Um, I wasn't even sure what I thought at the time I started making the film. It was more um, to present images um, as I saw them, as truthfully as I could tell them um, in an artistic sense, uh, and to, to actually explore my own values. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I went to a large public um, school, academic school. Um, very diverse culture. Um, I actually didn't realize um, that being Jewish was a minority until I was in college because everybody in New York City I knew was, was Jewish. <laughs> so I grew up in a multi-faith, um, multi-ethnic tradition um, and that was lovely because there was a good exchange of ideas and, and I was influenced by other people's culture. Um, in college, I studied political science, but I also studied ethics, religion, um, and philosophy. And I didn't see a big difference between those disciplines at the time. I think religion and ethics and philosophy informs our legal system, and in fact is the basis of our legal system. Because isn't a legal system, after all, a social compact? It's the collection of rules that we all have agreed to abide by, but it's undergirded by, by faith, right? By a, sh a shared um, agreement on how we should behave, but also how we should treat one another. And if you violate the social compact, you have a fair process, or so I thought, for being accused and judged and punished. Um, but there would be fairness in that process. And so I think like most people, I assumed, because I didn't know anyone who was arrested, I didn't grow up in a place where people were over-policed. I assumed the process was fair. And I think um, that's a very important, it was a very important idea for me to, become, be, to challenge and to understand what it meant to challenge the idea and to really think about whether or not our system is actually as fair 
as I'd assumed it was. Um, so uh, I was working at a law firm. Um, it was a corporate practice. I was actually quite happy at my little neat corporate practice with nice suits and very organized, neat, you know, non-messy life. Um, and uh, a close friend of mine died. She was my uh, best friend. She worked in the office next to me. We spent all of our time together. And I had this real crisis. And I thought, is this why I'm here? Is this what I'm going to do with my professional life? Is this all there is? Um, am I going to work for corporations when I always thought I would work with people? So I went to ABC News, which is not quite becoming Mother Teresa, but it was closer for me to people. And I was working with journalists, and they were telling stories. And some of them were important, and some of them were silly. But um, it was very creative and exciting. I was using different parts of my brain. Um, but my job, and I hope you will all be heartened to hear this, um, was news ethics and standards. So it really harkened back to my college training, which was studying philosophy and ethics. Um, and in my job, it was determining, as a news network, what are our policies? But really, you're also asking, what are our ethics? What are the journalistic ethics? There are legal rules about what you can show in the world, but there are also ethical rules. Just because we can identify a rape victim, should we? Is that necessary to journalism? Or is it some voyeuristic need to identify a person who's already been traumatized? If a child makes a statement that's inflammatory but might be sensational, should we air that statement? So I was having a lot of those kinds of conversations. Um, really a very dreamy job in a lot of ways. Um, and along the way, I began to realize in a very clear way um, how important media images were. One of the projects we, we spearheaded during my time at ABC was a look at um, who were the experts we were retaining. So you know the talking head people you see who will tell you what's happening in Pakistan or what's happening in criminal justice? You know, and we started looking at them, they all looked alike. They were all white, they were all male. This was the voice, uh, the authoritative voice that people accepted. And so part of what my group did is said to the journalists, why aren't you bringing in other people, other backgrounds? And, you know, and I find this over and over, it's not because people are overtly racist, it's not because they're bad people, it's because they're doing a job quickly and they go to the same people over and over. But what happens is you begin to live in an echo chamber and you only see one worldview. So one of the things we did was we asked people to, we created a list of experts of, of different faiths and different ethnicities and genders and said, just take a look at this list first. Talk to some of these people. Um, and we started to see a change on air about the voices that were coming in. And that led to a better audience. So you know that's kind of a win-win in doing ethics, right? It, it lifts everything. Um, I went to A&E Television, and I worked there. Um, and I started realizing you know, the images I was seeing of African Americans in particular um, were either non-existent or bad. And I thought, at that point, I had been working in media for 12 years, reviewing uh, pieces. So I was in edit rooms. I was reading scripts. I was working with producers. And I feel now like that was my film school. I could see how a, a compelling story could be put together. What was good pacing? How you make somebody look good or how you make somebody look bad? Um, and what editorial? There are a thousand editorial choices a day that influence what the audience believes about what they're seeing. So it was very important about who's creating those images. Because if you are not sensitive or thoughtful, if you don't care about how you portray different minorities or women or top, different topics, you can actually do more than a bad job. You can do harm. So I invite you to think today about the images that we have seen recently. Think about, and it's hard to think about these, right? It's exhausting. And it reflects a side of our humanity that sometimes we would rather not think on. What does it mean when you see any person choked to death in the street? And when you see bystanders not stop it, when you see that happen at the hands of the police who are trained and who I have taught my children to respect and honor, that's very confusing to them. What do I tell my, my children now? Should they trust the police? I have two 
black sons, 13 and 11. They are like any other 13 year olds, which means they're kind of crazy and they don't listen all the time and they're headstrong and they want to make their mark, at least my 13 year old. My 11 year old's a really good listener. Um, but, you know, what do I teach him? And I'll tell you, the other night um, we got locked out of the house. My husband's away in California, we got locked out of the house and I drove 25 minutes to my babysitter's house to get the keys and then drove back. And my, my neighbor who does a carpool with me said, why didn't you just go to the police? And I thought it never occurred to me to call the police at 10.30 at night when I was locked out with my two sons. And it was a real moment for me. I, I, I realized how impacted I have been in such a negative way. I had a fear, in, I've lived in my same nice suburban town for 15 years. I have not been stopped or pulled over. None of those things had actually happened to me, but I have internalized for myself and for my children, I've internalized a fear of the police. And I, I find that really tragic, and I don't want that to be the case. I don't want to give up on government. I want to be part of this society. So I tell you all this background um, to tell you when I started making this film, I actually knew nothing about criminal justice. I knew nothing. Um, I probably knew less than nothing. I deeply knew nothing. Um, and what I knew was confusing to me. Um, what I knew was, uh, you know, I used to work um, when I was in law school. Uh, I went to Georgetown and we had a, a, it was called the sex discrimination clinic. But really what it was, was we would, we would secure orders of protection for women who were being domestically abused. Um, and so that was my orientation into the criminal justice system. I saw these men kind of, you know, taking advantage of women. I was actually quite right on crime. I was really quite like, lock people up and keep people safe. It was such a monolithic, I'm ashamed of my view today. I really am. Um, so I, I tell you that to tell you, um, you too can change if you were like me. Um, you can keep your mind open, which is why I appreciate your, your introduction. So um, in 2009, I met Jonathan Rapping, um, who uh, is uh, a really gifted law professor, lawyer, and he um, had brought together a training program for young public defenders. So for anybody who's an undergraduate here, they are certainly not that much older than you are. They were in their 20s. It was their first job out of law school. And he invited me to come down. Um, and I had been thinking about making a documentary, even though I had never done one before. And I had been thinking about, um, I've been thinking about what is compelling? What is worth my time? What do I want to leave in the world? What do I want to add? Um, and so I went to Alabama. I had never been to Alabama before. I grew up in New York City. I won't tell you what I thought was going to happen in Alabama when I got there. You know, I thought I was going to be like grabbed in the night. Um, and I met these young lawyers and they were there for a two week boot camp and they're fresh out of law school and they're all excited and they're, they were talking about the Constitution, like lawyers talking about the Constitution. And they were talking about helping people and they were talking about just, you know, like poverty, and I kind of burst into tears, and I thought, this is what I was supposed to do, and how come I didn't know it, you know, and, and how come I didn't understand all of this before? So I spent, you know, some time with them, um, and I, I just learned so much. So that's kind of how my film began. Um, and if you see the film, you'll see there's not a narrator. Um, there are not there's one kind of talking head person. He's not even really a talking head. Because what I wanted to do artistically was allow anyone who views the film to come to the topic with their own and make their own judgments. I am thrilled for you to decide what you think. Um, and for if the film spurs you to think about things differently, terrific. If you come away secure in your thinking, also terrific. Um, but as long as I, what I didn't want to do is interrupt your experience. I didn't want to be a lecturer. I didn't want to um, stop you from coming to your own opinions. Um, but along the way, here's some of the things I learned. Um, so um, I'm going to now tell you some things that are actually not in the film, um, but I think are important as we understand where we are in this moment in criminal justice reform, how we got here, and why it's so important that all of us care. 
Um, so that's what this is. So um, today, uh, you may have heard these statistics before, but um, in America, we are about 2.2 to 2.3 million people in prison um, in America, prison and jails. Um, anybody know what that next country is? It's China. Yes, you little, little quiet, quiet people here. Um, yes, that is China, um, which is not typically thought of as a human rights protectorate, um, but that's China has with far more, with a far higher population, has far fewer people in prison. Um, you know what that third country is? It's Russia, right? So yet another place that we don't think of as a place that is anti-punishment um, or doesn't, you know, kind of quickly put people in prison. Um, another pop highly populous country has far fewer people in prison or jail than America the land of the free, the home of democracy, where people are treated fairly. How can that be? How did we get to this place in the world? Um, so it's helpful to look back to history. I'm a Swarthmore College person. I like facts. I like digging things. I'm a liberal arts person. You know, I like connecting the dots. I like puzzles. So back in 1972, so we're back in like the Nixon era there, we had about 300,000 people in prison. And so look at where we are today. Huge leap, right? Huge leap over this period of time, which is actually, when I think about it, 1972, I was in first grade, and now here I am today. So in the course of my um, conscious life, that's what happened. This is another great way to look at it. Um, although we think we are the center of the universe, the United States actually only has 5% of the world's population. But look at the share of the prison population that we have. We have a quarter. One of every four people in prison in the world lives here, is in prison in America. It's a huge number, right? So do you think we're more violent than other people in the world? Are we more, are we the criminal society that the world should be afraid of? Are we the criminals? America, is that how you think of us? How you think of yourself? Because this is you, this is all of us, right? So, as we said in the introduction, it's 12.4 million people are arrested each year. This is not from my airy-fairy ACLU friends, like, ginning up the numbers. This is from the FBI. Um, and so it shows you what kinds of police activity we have, how many people with what frequency are being arrested. So um, who's getting arrested? And when you start to look at who's getting arrested, um, I think there are questions that are troubling. So. White males, about 30% of the population, um, and arrested at about 30%. Um, Latino males, about 28% of the population, arrested at about 40% um, of the arrest, and that number is growing. Black males, 20% of the population, and yet 60% of the people arrested. So it raises some troubling questions. And there's probably only a couple of things that explain this. Are black males committing more crime, you know, and are, are they more violent, more dangerous? Um, are they doing, committing more illegal behavior? Um, or is there something else happening? And so I invite you, as we talk tonight, and as you have this wonderful opportunity to have people come in and share their thoughts, I invite you to actually confront that question. And I invite you to confront it in a way, ask yourself the source of your knowledge. If you think that black people and black men commit more crimes, ask yourself, how do you know that? Where did you learn that? What information do you have? You're liberal arts people at a really well-respected university about to go into the world. Question your knowledge. Question where you're getting that information. And when you start to question and go dig and look for yourself, um, the answers are troubling. So. Um, another way to say it, nearly half of black men will be arrested by the age of 23. For Latino men, it's 38%. Um, and here's just another way to say it. Um, African Americans are 13.6% of the population, but 28.4% of the people arrested, so more than twice the population number. Um, when we start to t think about criminal justice, the uncomfortable, hard question is, you know what? I want systems to be fair, but I also want to be safe. You know, I have children, I have a husband, I have family, I want them to be safe. So then we start to say, why are we arresting people? What kind of culture of incarceration do we have? And that's where 
you start to answer some of the questions about race and about who's getting policed and who's getting arrested and for what. So drug offenses. Um, this is the federal prison population. Look what percentage drug offenses are of people in jail. 50%. When you think about the things that we want people to be arrested for, for violence, for rape, robbery, murder, things that we want our criminal justice system to protect us about, isn't it shocking that that's the smallest percentage of what people are actually getting arrested for? Other property immigration offenses. People are arrested for immigration offenses. You are put in jail because you violated our immigration policy and other offenses. So I'm not even sure like, what the others are. Um, state prisons. So really interesting to see for drug offenses, same kind of thing happening in state prisons. Um, in uh, uh, back um, 20 years ago, about 45,000 people in prison for drug offenses. Look where it is today, 550% increase. So if you start to target drug offenses, that's where you start to get um, some of our, um, these big numbers. So you might say, um, I'm actually gonna do this so you don't focus on it because you can't help but read whatever's up there. And even if I said don't read it, you would still read it. So I don't want you to raise your hands, particularly because there are some like civilians and parents and professors in the audience. But for those of you who are students here, please do not raise your hands. You may, anybody know anybody who's ever used marijuana or other illegal drugs? Do you know anybody who's done that? Probably. Even here, I would say probably. Um, there's one person who says he knows nobody who's ever used illegal drugs, so happy for you. Um, are there a lot of drug raids in the colleges that you know about, in college campuses? There's drugs in college campuses across America. Do we hear a lot about college police officers going room to room every day, day after day? We know there's drug activity there, right? If you want to stop drug activity, wouldn't you go where the drugs are? Why wouldn't we go to drug college campuses? Why wouldn't we do raids there? Instead, you know where we do drug raids. We do drug raids in low-income neighborhoods, in housing projects, in, people where poor, in places where poor people live. Maybe that bothers you, maybe it doesn't. Maybe poor people's drug use is different from your drug use. I'd ask you to just pause and think about that. Is it okay? if a wealthy person uses drugs and a poor person, but not okay if a poor person does, what's the difference? So, you know, we kind of start to put all these things together and you say, well, maybe minority people use more drugs. And so that's this next slide. So it turns out white Americans are more likely than black Americans to have used most kinds of illegal drugs and blacks are far more likely to go to prison for it. Um, so what explains those differences? Um, so, um, understanding all of this, um, it became really interesting to me to understand what is our system of protecting people who are arrested, right? Um, and so I started, I'm going to actually uh, skip this little part, um, because I want to focus on this, because I think it's really apropos of your, your lecture series topic. So, 80% of defendants charged with felonies, most serious crimes, rely on public defenders. They're eligible for a public defender. So what do you have to do to get a public defender? What do you have to be? Poor. Do you have to be anything else? Do you have to apply? Do you have to fill out a form? You just have to be poor. So think about that for a minute. We have 12 million plus people getting arrested every year. Number of those for felonies, probably about half of that number is for felonies. Of that number, 80% of those people being arrested are poor. So when you start to think about that, you start to think about who is actually being brought into our criminal justice system, it's really troubling, right? It really makes us question whether we are applying the same rules across the board for everybody. Um, and so it also means it's really important who our public defenders are, right? Because if our public defenders are defending most of the people brought into the system, we want to know that they're, they're good, that they're going to be able to, um, they're going to be able to do their jobs. So I'm going to try it from here. See? Okay. Um, so let me ask you, 
Anybody here know any public defenders? Two people. One person's maybe sure, maybe she knows somebody. She's like a half a public defender, like a part-time. Part-time public defender, maybe, so, okay. Um, but not very many of you, right? So, so where do you get your images? If you don't know somebody, where do we get our images from people, right? Where do we, where do we learn about things that we don't know about? TV, TV, yay, we love TV. TV's so great, love TV. Um, so, what do you know about public defenders? What do you, just yell it out. Even for those of you who haven't seen my great movie about how awesome they are. Like, what do you think about public defenders? You don't have to be polite. Go ahead, say it. I know what you think. They're underpaid. This is where people always start. They start with the polite stuff. What else? Are they good? Do you want one if you're in trouble? No. Why don't you want one? They're not good, right? What else? Why are they not good? Okay, you guys are so polite. They're overworked, but they're lazy. They're disheveled. They're that crazy lawyer wearing a stained clothes. They're probably the bottom of the barrel of their class. What else? Come on, I'm giving you all the good stuff. You know what you think. No resources. They have no. Re oh, you're so polite. You're, they have no resources. That's right. Better call Saul. They're not, these are not people you want to be near. But remember what I just told you? 80% of people being charged with crimes, this is their choice. So, now very interesting, you all are embarrassed and you're, you're polite, so you wouldn't say what you really think, but I know what you think, because that's what I thought too. So three of you in this audience here actually knew a public defender, but all of you had an opinion about them. So where'd you get your information? Law and order. Law and order. <laughs> law and order. So there's a funny thing about law and order. Who's here has seen law and order? I know you've all seen law and order. Who has seen it like a thousand times, right? Like me. So rainy day, din, 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 law and order's on. Like that's safe. That's going to be fun. It's going to be good, right? Um, and there's so many of them. Like you probably, if you've seen it before, you've forgotten it already. So you can just watch it again. So next time you have a law and order marathon eating pizza on a rainy day in your house because you're not studying, which you should be doing, um, watch the beginning. At the beginning of law and order, which everyone in America and across the world has seen a thousand times, it says there are two groups that protect the public, the prosecutors and the police. Who's missing from that? The public defender or the defense lawyer. The Constitution, the Sixth Amendment, gives you a right to a fair trial. And the Supreme Court decided unanimously that that requires a defense lawyer. So actually, a public defender is one of the only jobs that's kind of guaranteed by the Constitution. But they didn't make the law and order intro. So as you're re what's re being reinforced in your brain, in all of our brains, is that what we look to, who we should be supporting, who we are gonna empower are the prosecutors and the police. So think about when law and order has been on, right? It's been on over the past decade, 15 years. Think about how powerful the police and prosecutors have become over that time. We don't question their behavior. And so we've gotten to a point where we have empowered the police, we have said we trust you, we believe you, we are not allowed to question you. If you question police behavior, you're anti-American. It's like questioning a veteran, right? It's not something that you do. But what that means is then when you start to have police acting inappropriately, there's, there's no mechanism for that. There's no public way to criticize the police that doesn't feel anti-American or feel inappropriate somehow. It's shameful to criticize the people who risk their lives to protect us. So we have to figure out a way to criticize police who violate our social compact without criticizing the entire whole. And I position to you that that's actually true about everything in life. We have to figure out a way to criticize the people who break laws and are criminals and people who um, maybe have grown up poor and are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Stereotypes are, are not effective for a reason, right? They're not helpful for a reason. So um, when I met lawyers, um, public defenders, I came to that, them with all these stereotypes. And then I met people um, who changed my mind. So when we look at those, um, when we hear Brett Willis talk, um, 
There's nothing objectionable in what he's saying, right? That's what we all believe. We believe that you're innocent until proven guilty, that you deserve a, a, a good defense, and yet um, there's so little public support for the Office of Public Defenders and for their role. And that was really what um, kind of motivated me to, to start making the film. It's also why um, we started the film with Travis as uh, part of his closing argument. Because whatever you think a public defender is, you don't think it's that. You don't think it's some like in-your-face guy whose voice cracks when he talks about the Constitution and when he reminds the jury of what it actually means. And the prosecutors routinely, I saw this in Georgia over and over again, would say it's not a big case. Now, why would you say to a jury it's not a big case? Because you want to absolve people of their role in prosecuting and putting somebody in prison. You want them to feel it's not a big deal. But you know what? It's a huge deal. So if you're convicted of a felony, do you know what the consequences are? What can't you do once you're convicted of a felony? You can't vote. Voting's kind of important, right? We've seen elections be really super close. Remember, again, 80% of the people who are convicted of felonies are, or are charged with felonies are represented by public defenders. Um, anybody know what the percentage of cases that go to, actually go to trial are? What do, you, what do you guess? Of 100% of cases in America each year, what percent actually go to trial? What is law and order? What is the big pool they're drawing from to, to find all those cases? What do you think? What do you think? How many cases go to trial? Yeah. 30%, yes. What do you think? 40%, yep. Yeah. There's $1 back there somewhere. OK, what do other people think? 30%, 10%, anybody else? It's 5%. It's 5% of cases go to trial. So you know, when you think of our American criminal justice system, you think if you're accused of something, you'll get your day in court, you get a good lawyer, and you'll get to proclaim your innocence or defend yourself. So now do again, do the layering. Do the liberal arts college layering. 80% of people charged with felonies are poor. 95% of cases that are coming to the system plead guilty. Who's pleading guilty and getting felony convictions, right? And what does that mean for our system of democracy, for our social system? Um, in addition to not being able to vote, you can't get student loans. Anybody here need student loans in order to get an education? Couple. Um, you can't live in public housing. Uh, sometimes you can't get a driver's license. Sometimes you, there's other restrictions on what you do. So if you're poor and you need things like student loans and maybe to live in public housing, um, it's really a big deal if you get a felony conviction or if you plead to a felony. So that's why it's important when Travis points out they say that it's not a big case. It is a big deal if you are a poor person and you come with a felony conviction or you've pled to a felony. It's a huge deal. It could ruin your life, right? Um, so interesting fact, um, when we think about indigent people, sometimes we think that means it's like homeless people, people on the street. 70% um, of defendants using public defenders had a job at the time of their arrest. So we're also really talking about the working poor. These are people who are just at the edge, right? They're just keeping it together. And you get arrested, um, and it can just upset that apple cart. If you are, um, I interviewed one woman who, um, single mother, she gets arrested. Um, what happens to your kids? They go to foster care. Once they're in foster care, you have to fight to get them back without any money, without a place to live because you lose your house. They don't keep your apartment while you're in jail trying to get out, trying to raise bail. Um, they don't keep your job. You're not, there's no requirement that your job has to be there for you. So being arrested, not being able to make bail, huge, huge amount of pressure on people to plead to something to get out if they are offered that deal. Um, I'm going to show you another piece. I'm going to do this. Oops. Um, OK. So I'm, oops. I messed it up. I was about to say I was so proud of myself. Um, OK, go back. No? Nope. 
don't know what the cone means. It's a bad cone. <laughs> no? No cone? Okay. I just need to go back. Oh, okay. I just can't stop it. Can I hit pause? Okay. Okay. So, as I was making this movie, before I met public defenders, I thought they were kind of crazy, to tell you the truth. Like, in law school, you know, we'd go out after a hard week of working, and you just want to kind of relax with your friends and talk about silly stuff and whatever. And you'd go out with the public defenders, and they'd all be like, do you know how many people are in jail? And they'd just be like, you know, really worked up all the, all the time. They're always worked up. So I kind of thought they were crazy. And in fact, my husband, my now husband, my then boyfriend, he did something called the um, Criminal Justice Clinic. And so he was defending, he was a student defense lawyer. And um, he used to defend, there was this one man, Mr. Sally. And Mr. Sally was a 65-year-old, I can't believe I'm telling Mr. Sally's story. He, he would love this. So Mr. Sally was a 65-year-old heroin addict. And the way he would support himself is he would break windows and he would steal things from people. And this outraged me. Remember I told you I was kind of right on crime. Very liberal socially, right on crime. And I was like, Mr. Sally should just go to prison for life. And he's a, a menace. Um, and you know, I was really, really kind of judgmental and not a way that any person should be. Um, and my husband, we went to Florida on vacation to visit his parents. And he went to visit Mr. Sally. And he gave him a hostess fruit pie and a Polaroid snapshot of our car, because he didn't want him to break into our car while we were gone. Um, you know, and, and he would visit Mr. Sally, and he brought his supervisor, and Mr. Sally would say, oh, I'm glad you brought your secretary. You know, take this down. And I was outraged that Mr. Sally was sexist. You know, the fact that he was a heroin addict and, like, all that stuff. It was, like, his sexism that was really troubling. Um, but what my, my husband had then that I did not have um, was kind of a, a more sophisticated idea of coming to people where they are. And is the criminal justice system the right way to deal with a recidivist heroin addict who has a drug problem? He actually was a very nice man, other than his sexism. But um, <laughs> should he be in the criminal justice system? Is, do we want the criminal justice system taking care of people like Mr. Sally? Anyway, so, so I you know, come to this film thinking public defenders are crazy. And um, so when I meet them, and they're, they're like Travis, and he's so full of life, and they're like Brandy. And then I started thinking, what does this feel like emotionally? If you're 20-something, um, tell me what it takes to defend a case. What do you have to do to defend a case? So I already picked on you. You're paying attention, looking me in the eye, so now you are picked on. What do you have to do to defend a case? What does a defense lawyer do? Just one thing. Research, exactly. You got to know the law, right? So you have all this research you got to do. What else do you have to do to defend a case? Meet with, the Meet with your client. Are, is there any jails around here? The jails are kind of far away, right? So if you've got a client, you've got to spend 50 minutes getting to your jail. You got to wait for your client to come be pulled up from lockdown. Then you got to meet with them. Then you got to drive back 50 minutes. So half of your day meeting with one client, right? You got to research. You got to meet with your client. What else do you got to do? You got to discovery. You got to investigate the facts, right? If you're in jail and your parents are saying, what did you do for my kid's case today? I want to think that you went to the scene of the crime. I want to th think that you spoke to witnesses. All right, so this is what you're doing for every case, right? So knowing that, how many people could you, how many cases could you work on at a time? Two. Two would be a lot, right? You're like, you have to go find witnesses in bad neighborhoods. You got to find somebody to go with you because it's unsafe. You got to go to jail. You got to do legal research. You got motions. You got stuff to do. It'd be a lot to juggle that. Anybody else like a little, little, you know, they can do more? Five. Five. He's a hard worker. He's gone through graduate school. He's got it. He could do five. So most of the public, all the public defenders I worked with represented 120 to 180 people at a time. Those are felony cases. They also had 300 to 500 misdemeanor cases at one time. In Florida today, there was a, the public defender's office sued the state because they were representing 500 felony clients at a time. 500. Are you going to be able to go to visit 500 witnesses and 500 cases and talk to 500 families? Of course you can't. 
It's literally impossible. And so when you start to think about it, it becomes a system of triage. No matter what they do, it's never enough. There's always some other case that's not being investigated, some other family you're not calling back. It's this, this constant pressure. And so that's what I was curious about in making this film. What does that feel like if you're the person? Literally, the person is depending for their life on you. If you do a good job, they get a trial or they get a good result. If you don't get to their case, Maybe they plead to something, maybe they plead to something they didn't do. Maybe an innocent person is sitting in jail because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So when you start to look at the criminal justice system through other eyes, through the eyes of the accused, rather than the people with the power, it starts to look really different. It starts to look scary. Um, you know, I find that pretty dramatic. Like she's walking into court alone, into that big courthouse, and that person's family is looking to her. The, certainly the defendant is looking to her. Um, her client was charged with stealing $250 with a gun. A gun charge in Georgia is a mandatory four years. Robbery, any amount, is a mandatory 10 years, maximum life. His first offense, first charge. So he was facing 14 years to life in prison, no parole. So when she says the stakes are as high as they could possibly be, that's right. Um, he's uh, 17 facing at least 14 years in prison. It's almost his whole life he would be looking at if he got the best case result. Um, and so I was curious about what that would mean emotionally um, for, a, for a lawyer. Uh, oops, okay. So um, I made this film not knowing any of this. <laughs> I made this film being curious about what kind of lawyer would take on this kind of emotional, financial um, stress. And when I thought about whether public defenders are crazy, um, I think they are a little, because you have to be a little crazy to take this on. But I feel crazy too now. I feel like this is part of, of my mission, is to talk to people, is to share these experiences. Um, is to allow you to bring this into your life in a way that hopefully you can take it in and take what you will from it and use it as you go out and inform your own choices and vote um, and become part of your communities. So uh, with that, I'm extremely grateful to be invited and for your attention. Um, even though you're so polite, you really did pay attention, so I like that. So thank you very much, and I'll take your question. So happy to answer your questions either about making a film or about the cases or anything that you're curious about. So. Hello. In your uh, film, you show some public defenders who have been defending for a really long time and they kind of seem like they know how to um, survive public spending. And I was wondering, what exactly allows them to do that and what kind of characteristics um, keeps people going in like such situations where it just seems like kind of pointless to, to work? Yeah, you know, um, it's very interesting. I have this theory um, that, because I interviewed, I mean, tons of public defenders in the course of, so it took three and a half years to make the movie. We have hundreds of hours of footage. A lot of it's, you know, obviously not in the film. Um, I think that there's one basic trait that every single public defender I've met shares, and you just have to find out what it is. They feel a little bit like an outsider for some reason, um, and they are a little bit mistrustful of, of conventional authority. So Travis, it turns out, was arrested as a kid. Um, so he knew what it was like to be on the wrong side of the police attention. Uh, I met another guy whose little brother um, was a Down had Down syndrome, and he was always watching his brother be picked on. Um, Brandy grew up without knowing her father and always felt kind of outside of things. And so um, the ones who succeed are able to manage their emotions, and I think that that's the biggest challenge for them because um, what you find 
is you get very close with your clients. And it doesn't matter what they're accused of, of what they've done, they're human beings to you. And you want them to be treated fairly. And it's so often difficult to get a fair treatment um, the way our system is set up. So people who manage not to become alcoholics, there's a lot of alcoholism in public defense work, um, or otherwise self-destructive. People who have a good family structure and who are able to walk away from the work. But think about it. If you're in jail and you're his mother, you don't care if I'm going to Disney World. You want me to get your kid out of jail. You want me to protect your kid so that they're not beaten or abused. Um, and so that's a lot of pressure. People feel really guilty about taking care of themselves. They kind of have ultra mother syndrome. So, so that's what I think. Uh, <clears throat> I saw your movie and uh, I, I got another look at really what the public defender is. But I also felt so good that I've been involved a little bit with the Lawndale Christian Legal Center. And it would seem to me, and you know much more and better than I do, but we as Christians, churchgoers, ought to be supporting that type of ministry within the inner city because not only do they defend them, they have a deal where they get them back now or the way it had been if a kid misses an appointment with his parole officer because his car broke down or the bus had a wreck, they grab him and put him right back in jail. Now they bring them to that law center and they're training them and they're getting them jobs and, and there's not just Lawndale, uh, there's another, a couple others in within Chicago, but they got top lawyers and they get pro bono from some of the big law firms and I think at least it would help if we could get that done in more places and thank you for your movie and your heart for it. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, what you are pointing to is absolutely one of the most critical pieces of this pie. It's public involvement, um, but it's also literally becoming my brother's keeper, right? Um, it's saying, I understand that people might need some help and maybe they're not perfect people, but who among us is perfect? Um, but wouldn't we rather try and put some help for people who are clearly in need um, rather than locking them up repeatedly? So it's absolutely, it's so critical what you're saying. People don't understand about probation. A probation violation can mean you didn't get your driver's license, you didn't show up for a meeting even if you missed the bus or your kid was sick or you were sick. It's a probation violation. And if you get picked up, you go right back to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. And in fact, you may not be eligible for parole again. And so I'm not quite sure what, what purpose that serves for a minor technicality. You know, people are always saying public defenders get people off on a technicality. The Constitution's not a technicality. You're right, you're innocent until proven guilty. The state should do its job. It has a lot of resources. So what you're saying, those programs are literally life and death for people. Um, and I'm glad you are part of it, and I hope other people will um, examine those. They're very, very satisfying volunteer opportunities. They can be. So I, thank you. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I'm here with a, a group of students from another university. My name is Doug Miller, and I'm interested on their behalf and for my own interest in knowing more about how you've developed your editorial eye. Obviously, you said you didn't really know a whole lot about this heading into it and that what you learned changed you deeply in the process. So going through the process, I'm sure that you know your decisions that you were making, your editorial decisions changed as you learned more and more and more, right? Um, they did, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's a great question because um, I came out of a news background where, you know, the, the holy grail is objectivity. 
well, who's objective? You know, we're all products of our experiences and what we've learned and what we've taught and how we've been raised and we all have a point of view. So it was very hard for me to go away from that objectivity and everybody gets to debate things. And I kind of had to decide what I believed. And I, I so that is kind of why I settled on, I'll let them tell their stories instead of me telling you what I think. And um, I certainly evolved quite a bit. And we, I, there were some tough moments. You know, I would, I would go and I would see really awful things happening to people and I felt like they were being abused. And then I would come home and my wealthy fed kids who were going to piano and tennis and lessons and they were asking for Xbox 19, you know, and my five-year-old was like, can I have an Xbox 19? And I was like, no, are you in jail? You know, my husband said, <laughs> you really got to calm down. Like, he's just five. Um, but it's part of that crazy making. And so um, I think when you're a documentary person, you have to be really rigorous with yourself. You have to decide, um, you, to me, you have to decide to be as scrupulously fair to people as you can. I always would say, give people their best shot. And then put those moments together and see, does this strike me as a good representation of what I saw? Um, and you're constantly asking yourself that question over and over and over. Is this actually what I saw rather than what I want to see? Yeah, kind of going off of the news aspect and journalism aspect of that, from your experience in the world of media, what would be one piece of advice that you would give to college students that are looking to pursue um, a job or opportunity in the world of media and more specifically journalism? There's no substitute for hard work. There are no shortcuts. Do not rely on Wikipedia. If you're gonna report on somebody, go meet them. Go ask them the questions you would wanna be asked. Um, there's a really great exercise um, that the public defenders do. And uh, they have, so they'll have a team. And you and I will be in the team. And I have to tell you about the most important thing in my life, like one really important story that nobody knows. And then you tell me the same thing. And then they have the people sit and you have to tell the whole room about my story, and I have to tell them about yours. And what that does is it gives you the experience of being a defendant. When you're a defendant, you're not allowed to talk. Your lawyer speaks for you. So if your lawyer doesn't get the facts right, you know, what if somebody's telling about when you were six and you learned to ride a bike, and it's Aunt Jane who gave you the bike, and then Aunt Jane died, and so this is really meaning for you. And what if I get the person's name wrong? What if I get the state wrong? You start to lose confidence. It's a very frustrating experience. So understanding it's a privilege to report on people, and it's worth your extra time to check facts yourself and not um, rely on other people's reporting. If you're gonna put your name on it, and even if you're not, if you're gonna put it out into the world, try and make sure it's true. Like there's just no shortcuts, particularly in news reporting. Hi, so um, also from the group of students over here, one of the things we had to do before we came to this lecture was to do a little bit of research both on the film and on you and your career. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and one of the things I found was an interview in which you said that um, one of the reasons you wanted to look at these public defenders was because you wanted to know why are they so happy with yeah. what they're doing. And I was wondering if at the end of all of this, you know, now that the film is done, do you think you have an answer to that question? Um, oh, what a lovely question. Um, I think that, yes. And I think that they are happy. Um, I think that they sleep peacefully at night um, because they are helping people. Um, and it's quite a satisfying feeling to feel like somebody who desperately needed you, you extended a hand. There is just no <laughs> greater feeling than that. Um, and I think that they get those opportunities so much more than most of us. Um, and I think for a number of them are actually living their values. Um, they believe in the lessons that were taught in church and other places, that we don't judge, that we help those with less than ourselves. Um, he without sin cast the first stone. I think that they are living their values and that that's a very peaceful and satisfying feeling. Yeah, so looking at the statistics and the pretty dire conditions that many public defenders face, um, I guess it's just easy to become very overwhelmed and even cynical. So my question is, are you hopeful that legislation or public advocacy or 
something else can transform the situation in, in any kind of way after your research? Are you hopeful? Um, I am hopeful. I mean, I, for better or worse, tend to be a hopeful person, but um, I'm really hopeful because I see young person after young person, even knowing all of this information, going to do this job, which means there's something in our society, the good part of our society is actually filtering through, where people want to have meaningful lives and are not afraid to take on the hard questions. The other thing that makes me incredibly hopeful is I do a lot of these talks, um, both through a speaker society, but also through schools. Um, the Ford Foundation sponsored a cross-country screening tour, and people get it. You know, Americans, we do have shared values that are positive, um, whether religiously based or not. Um, you know, we all have known two-year-olds. What's the first thing a two-year-old says? That's not fair, right? You have a younger brother, younger sister, they get something, you get something they don't get, that's not fair. And so from a very young age, we are taught to value fairness. And I think when people see and start to examine facts and they think that's not fair, they don't like it and they don't want to be part of that, and they don't want that done in their name. And so that makes me very hopeful. I also think there's some concrete things happening. Um, there's some legislation being introduced. There are bills. There's both on the political right and the political left. People are saying, this doesn't work. Let's do something else. And so that makes me hopeful, too. Not only uh, two-year-olds, they just did a study. Dogs know the difference <laughs> when it's not fair, seriously. Um, but. Um, Many years ago, I saw F. Lee Bailey speak in a room very much like this at uh, my college when I was a young student. And um, the big takeaway from that was he was talking, and this was in Miami, so you can guess the context of drugs. And um, he said, here's a scenario. You've got a guy. He's selling drugs. He sees someone who might be a witness against him. It's 15-year mandatory if he gets caught with the drug situation. If he shoots the guy and kills him and gets caught with that, he'll probably serve about seven years versus the 15-year mandatory. What's the math here? Pretty simple, right? So, you know, that was 35 years ago or more. Um, the mandatories are only getting more and more prolific in terms of taking away the rights of judges to judge. And, you know, we, we have a scenario here where that's a, just spitting out of control. Right. We do, I, I agree with you, we do have perverse disincentives to actual justice. Judges who are now routinely making statements on the record that they disagree with sentences imposed, um, that they feel so frustrated by that situation. But we enable this by electing the politicians who go out there and rally around the flag of, you know, hard on criminals and, and law and order and, and all that stuff. And you know they, they just completely run away with this idea of making themselves look good, getting reelected by carrying this banner of putting all those bad guys away, whether or not they've done it. And you know, to your point of those statistics you, that you brought up earlier, it's not a, it's not a um, it's not a linear equation. It's not anything close to it. You know, once a person is arrested, even if they've done nothing wrong, even if they get found not guilty, there's a whole litany of things that cause a real, real handicap from succeeding. He's lost, maybe if he's young, he's lost school year, it, you know, and all kinds of subsequent things. And have you ever been arrested? There's a checkbox on all kinds of employment applications. You're screwed. And, you know, um, when we think of how, that's why it's important to see how many people are going through that experience. Um, because it's masses of people who are affected by the check the box. Um, and, you know, the biggest, crime of that scenario is it's not keeping us safer. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, where are the statistics to prove that this is viable, this is valuable, this is serving a purpose? And the, the, the research is actually counter to that. Right. So yeah, the research gonna... from, from you know, uh, conservative think tanks, liberal think tanks, and people who call themselves nonpartisan, is our system of mandatory minimums and increasing arrests has done nothing to change the rate of crime. There there's, there's, hasn't been a correlation. So um, I, think, I think you're right. But I also think um, that more and more people are questioning this. We have overcrowded jails, which lead to really inhumane conditions, conditions that we would protest if they happen in other countries. Um, and I think that there's a, a growing dissatisfaction with that state of affairs. 
Well, thanks for taking your time to be here and do this, and I wish you could be in uh, about a thousand more places. Me because too. Kind of. There are not a lot of people <laughs> who are aware of the problem. You know, they I live think their that lives. that's true. They, they pay their you know, penance. My wife was driving on a major road um, in, a, in a situation that would make Al Capone look like a penny any you know, candy thief. Um, the cops set up a roadblock, pulling everybody over. She didn't have her insurance card. She gets stopped. I email it, a picture of it. Cops won't take it, so what happens? Yeah, she gets off, but she has to pay court costs to go prove that she's in take compliance. Take time off from work or so take time So they get a hundred bucks, or... and the, the cop gets a check box by quota, and you know, it, it, this kind of a police state is just really getting out of control. It doesn't have to be Ferguson to be really stacked against you, even in a you know, very suburban, very upscale kind of place. And you know, her experience, it's frightening. <laughs> It is frightening being stopped and having your liberty detained and realizing you can't leave. You can't talk them out of it. You can't have a reasonable, you know, email your your card, which should take care of it instead of making a whole lot of, you know, difficulty. Um, it's frightening, and that's not what it should be. So. Hi, I'm also part of the group with the students. Um, it's a good group. <laughs> Is this like extra credit or something or no? No, no, no okay. it's not, not extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> but as I recalled, uh, Travis's second client um, had a friend that helped the prosecution yeah. to get a lesser um, sentence. Yeah. Do you know what was that sentence? Um, yeah, so she's referring to a part in the movie. Um, Travis is defending a young man who they're accused of doing something together. One, man cooper one young man cooperates with the police and gets a reduced sentence. Um, so he got two years in the prison boot camp, which is what they were trying to get for Brandon. Um, part of the reason I was interested in that scene is so the, the young man who's accused, his name is Brandon. Um, when he was 12 years old, his mother left and abandoned him. Um, and she just left. He didn't have any adult in his life to take care of him, and he ended up in foster care. Um, he becomes very close friends with this kid, Cody, who has a family. Um, so Cody is not only a friend to him, he's his, his only family. And so when they are arrested together, um, you know, people are upset with Cody that he's going to the police. You know, I ask you, you're being faced with five years at least in prison, no parole, or the police say, if you just say something against this other person, you get two years in a much safer facility. Brandon, by the way, um, before he got out, he had been beaten very severely in prison. He had been left in his prison cell for four days on the floor with a broken jaw. Um, the, prison, the prison did not provide him with medical care for days. They thought he was faking an injury and they would just slide his food in and take it out. He actually had a broken jaw. Um, it had to be rebroken and reset and his mouth wired shut for months. So when he was afraid of going back to prison, the fear was very real. Um, so if you're facing that kind of brutality, what decision would you make? Um, so it's not to excuse, but to try and have some empathy for how difficult that choice would be. And you can see in the film how broken up he was about making that choice. I don't think that that was voluntary to tell on his best friend, even to save himself. Hello. Hello. Um, two questions. One is in reference to the film. The second is in reference to a, um, a question that stimulated when you were talking when, from when you worked with A and E. Mm -hmm. um, talked about like that's kind of when how images created stories. Yeah. Um, the question that popped up in my mind is recent activity that's been going on in the country that stimulated in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, it's two counties away from where I live, so mm -hmm. I'm familiar a little bit more with the area and a lot of mm -hmm. people. Um, one of the things I noticed, um, I lived in Los Angeles for the fall semester. Um, so I was catching news from people I knew and then national news. And I noticed in national news, the only images that you would see of the police force were um, problems that they were causing or police shootings that were happening that were completely Riot irrelevant. Right. Correct. Um, and it made me think even on a regular basis, excluding this, like in the past year, year and a half, when have we seen images of our police force in positive respects? The only time you hear of the police force is when there's negative attention drawn to them. So who in the network 
Because you're talking that the, it's the person that creates the image right. where they direct the public's portrayal. Right. So how is that? How is that more justice towards them versus to what how you were working with A and E? Yeah. Um, I think it's not, and I think it's a real problem. And I think that polarizing opinion and slanting it in any one particular way is just as is problematic when it is directed at our police force. It does us no good. It does me no good to be afraid of the police if that fear isn't warranted. I maybe should be cautious, um, but I'm clearly affected by those images and those stories. And I think that that is tragic. And I think that there's a much wider discussion about our news media, and that's part of the reason I left, um, is because what's sensational and thrilling and grabs your attention is what gets covered or created. Um, rather than what's real. Mm -hmm. And um, I find people are perfectly capable of understanding complicated, nuanced discussions and dumbing down our media so that, you know, we're at a moment in time where the police are all bad, right? So, except that you're not really allowed to criticize the police unless you're in the context of a racial justice, you know, scenario. But I think we still do have um, media images aside. I think that there is some... Um, in a lot of places that are not racial minority communities, it's still not acceptable to, to ask whether police practices are <coughs> out of hand. Um, so, but I think any abusive image is, is not serve the public and means you're not doing your job. So. Um, and the second one I have is in reference to the film. It really crossed my mind when, um, throughout watching the whole film, it was always the perspective of the victim, mm -hmm. and the victim in this case being the defendant. Um, but I was always curious about what is the prosecutor's evidence? Mm -hmm. What is the police, is the evidence that the police possesses? Right. Um, and I saw a little glimpse of that um, at the case at the end, but I was just curious if when making the film, if you also interviewed um, the prosecution perspective of the case as well. Yeah. So during the making of the film, I asked every single prosecutor multiple times in writing and in person if they would appear on camera, and none of them would. <laughs> and so because of that, I don't agree that the defendants are the victims. I think that they are the participants in, in what's happening. So my objective was in showing the perspective of a defense lawyer not to, sh to say this person's innocent um, or guilty or not. Brandon ends up pleading guilty. He says he's innocent. He ends up pleading guilty. There's no trial, so will we ever know what actually happened? But that's his, his story. So none of the prosecutors would talk to me. So then you have a, a problem, right? So, is, so what I tried to do is be really fair and not victimize the prosecutors, not say that these were bad prosecutions. And I actually don't think, the cases I picked, I don't think are bad prosecutions. I think that they certainly had enough evidence to go to trial or to, to push forward, and I think that's what happens every day. So um, I actually tried to be you know, overly cognizant of that fact. And I wish that they had spoken, because I think that that would have been really interesting. But it actually, push the film in a way that I, I hadn't intended. Um, and, and I'm happy with where it ended up, but that wasn't my intent. My intent was to talk to everybody. Um, as far as what evidence, no, we actually, we totally know what evidence there was against DeMontes. There were two eyewitnesses, and you heard from one of them. Um, what actually there was also, which I didn't show you, um, was uh, the police had done uh, a lineup show up. It's called a photo array where they had shown the eyewitnesses five young men. Well, one of them was DeMontes, and the four other men lived across the country. So the eyewitnesses said, that's him, we know him, we know who that is. So the eyewitnesses are being kind of led to a conclusion. The police were certain they had the person, um, and there are police tactics that lead them to that conclusion, and that's the evidence in that case. Other than that, there were no fingerprints, there were no, it was just eyewitness testimony. That's all there was, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Um, 
I have a perspective um, from the inmates' point of view when it comes to public defenders. Um, this week I met with a woman at DuPage County Jail um, who has been there 62 days, four children, separated between two homes. She has yet to be assigned a public defender. And she is in a place of hopelessness. Um, over the years, I don't think I can recall any um, inmate or offender who has a public defender that feels hopeful. Yeah, um, that is um, an absolute reality for far too many people. Um, and one of the things, I didn't show you this clip, but there's a, there's a clip of one of the public defenders and one of the things she has to do is tell her client she's not like the other people who represented her. So um, it's sadly, unfortunately, the case that people either through incompetence or inability are not getting to their clients and are not able to do a good job or not willing or not capable of doing a good job. So one of the things I wanted to, I felt, I felt like we know what the bad public defender is. And what I was interested in is what if you want to do a good job? What does that feel like when you're trying to do a good job? What are you facing? But I think it's even more criminal that people, 62 days, you know, I challenge anybody in here to spend one night in jail and worry about your children and worry about your job and your apartment. Um, and that, that is, a, is usually a function of the fact that there are 15,000 public defenders right. and there's 12 million people arrested. Right, but for the inmate themselves, when you're you know, discussing the topic of defending, um, what kind of defense, it's you know, in their minds, it's horrific. is it, is yeah. it going to bring hope and is it really, am I really going to be defended? And, um, you know, the, the inmates, um, we had, we interviewed this one guy who was in prison and um, he gave, we ended up not using it for a whole lot of other reasons, but he said, um, you know, we talk about the, the public defenders and they know which ones care and come and, and help. And often, if you're a public defender who's doing a good job or who has a good reputation, um, and many of them told me this, they would have the experience where even when they lost and they were devastated and on behalf of their clients, um, that the clients would thank them. And, and they would say, why are you thanking me? You're going, you know, this is terrible, you're going to jail, and da 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 da. And they said, well, you, you fought for me. You, you did your best. And it's not your fault that all these other things happen. So um, I think in the circumstance where you have the opportunity to be represented by somebody who actually cares and is equipped to do the job or somehow manages to figure it out, um, it's unfortunately too rare. And, um, and the, the people that suffer the most because of that are the people who are arrested. And then what inevitably happens is at some point she probably will give up and she'll just say she wants to take a plea and get home and get her kids together if she's allowed to take a plea. Yeah. And that's why you end up with 95% of people pleading. Um, so it's, it's a compound yeah. kind of question, which brings you back to it's really important to have good policing. It's important that there actually be a reason why people are brought in, yeah. um, and if you know there are other ways to. So I'm, I've been working on a project in San Francisco where the public defender there, the elected public defender, it's very rare to have a public defender be elected. Um, he, one of the reforms he spearheaded is putting cases that should not be in the criminal system out of it. So there's he has spearheaded a drug court, a mental health behavioral court. Um, a domestic violence court, where there's specialized judges who have training in those statutes, there's a specialized bar, um, and it's reduced the caseload for his public defenders um, to their representing now 40 people at a time instead of 400 people. And that means they can actually work on the cases, um, the cases that deserve a good big defense, they go to trial, they go to trial far more than other places. Other places, they work out a just solution. So, uh, you know, I feel like that could be a model for other places. So many people are in our criminal justice system because of drug offenses or drug addiction. Um, and maybe there's a better way than just locking them away and using our resources for that. Um, so. 
So thank you all very much. Please thank you. Can you tell us where? Can you tell us where people can find your film if they haven't oh, had a chance to see it? Yes. Um, so it, it was on HBO. So it's on HBO Go or um, Netflix or Amazon or iTunes. So. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.